163rd contact. Friday, February 26, 1982, 4.50 am. Quetzal says as I see, you still haven't come to rest today. Billy says how right you are, but I'm really not very tired. Quetzal says nevertheless, your need for rest is easily recognizable. I also don't want to keep you for too long but only inform you of the results which you asked me to clarify. But first of all, I would like to address something else that is, unfortunately, necessary to mention another time. Sentences 5 to 37 purely non-public, internal group and private matters. Billy says you please me damn little, my friend, that you stir up this matter again. As a result, I must first get some coffee and cigarettes. Quetzal says if you would be so kind, then I would also like the same drink. Billy says eh. Quetzal says I enjoy coffee every now and then. It is a refreshing hot drink. Billy says man, since when do you also poison yourself? Do you, perhaps, even want a cigarette? And how would you like your coffee? Should it contain a lot or a little cream and how much sugar? Quetzal says I refrain from tobacco products because they bring me no pleasure. But I've already been enjoying coffee since I've been on the earth. In moderate quantities, it is absolutely harmless. But I only drink it naturally and without sweeteners. Billy says so black, without sugar, but with a stirrer, right? Quetzal says. Billy says by stirrer, I mean a spoon. Quetzal says that isn't absolutely necessary. Billy says. Okay, then you have to wait a little. It will take a few minutes. When I go out, I latch the door from the outside. See you later. Billy says so, my friend black and hot as hell. Here's your brew. Quetzal says thank you. Billy says I'm glad that I can offer you something once. But now, I would still like to know what results you've obtained regarding the matters that I asked you to clarify. Quetzal says yes the premises that should be created. The continued negative feelings that you've had against this since last summer are of great exactness. Billy says so there. Crap. Quetzal says as you already explained to me in accordance with your feelings, everything would have gone on very well up to around the month of June, 1981 if the premises had been created by then. I could fathom this, without a doubt, through a review. But now, my look into the future has shown that your feelings are, in fact, of correctness because if the premises are created now, then very bad difficulties will arise for you. Not only would the authorities object to this, but you would be punished for it very severely, and moreover, the premises would be torn away by forces requested by the authorities. An unauthorized construction of the premises would only bring you serious harm in every respect. Billy says so crap after all. I leave it alone. If these are now built anyway then without me. I won't touch them and will deny all responsibility. I want to have this in writing from all who participate in a possible construction. Quetzal says you would do well in that, for as my look into the future has shown, very harsh measures will be taken by the authorities if the construction takes place. It's much too late for this undertaking. In January or February of 1981, it would have been completely different. At that time, everything would have found its correctness. But with the authority of Turbental, something will change in its leadership in the coming time, and it is this new leadership that won't be well disposed toward you and that would sue you very hard. Billy says this news will be unpleasant for some. Quetzal says certainly, but this isn't to change, moreover, only irrational reasons for the need for these premises are cited by those involved. Ferdinand and his family would find the better solution if they would acquire a mobile home, and as for Elsa, it is her own fault that now, her premises can't be created. For her, I remember very well that solely her oddball behavior didn't allow the construction, when it still would have been tolerated officially and would have been granted.
Benedict herself is an accommodation that will suit her very well for the time being if this is furnished accordingly. Billy says but she always complains that it is cold there. And warm it really is not. Quetzal says a suitable cold inhibitor would resolve this. Billy says that's right and that could also be done within a reasonable amount of time. It would just have to be insulated properly. However, she will still bring in her pretexts about her place. Quetzal says Eva has less space. Billy says that's also right, but Bernadette will still bring into play that it can't be expected of her that she must go over to the house with the infant in each case, etc. Quetzal says that is, in fact, irrational but of her. In any case, carrying the child to and back from the house will not harm the child. In inclement weather, the child can be wrapped in protective blankets, so that no harm arises from the effects of the weather. Sentences 69 to 76 purely non-public, internal group and private matters. Billy says man, and should I tell her all that? Quetzal says no, for I will transmit all my words to you, after which you can give her everything in writing. In addition, Engelbert and the board of directors should deal with this because you shouldn't have to strain your nerves for the time being. Quite simply, you aren't allowed to do that. Therefore, Bernadette should refer any such matters to the board of directors and to Engelbert but not to you. Billy says but still, Bernadette will come to me. Quetzal says the board of directors has to point out to her that such matters only fall into the area of the board of directors for the time being and that you may not be burdened. Billy says if that works, then it's good. But I think that the report shouldn't be handed over to all group members. Quetzal says nevertheless, it would be of correctness if all group members would be informed about these issues. Billy says can't it, at least, just be handled by the board of directors? Quetzal says the board of directors has to decide about that. Billy says you are cautious, my son. Quetzal says that is of necessity, but unfortunately, I haven't said everything yet, for sentences 87 to 93 purely non-public, internal group and private matters. Even here, we can in no way bring to bear our compulsion for the right action. We have actually worked out the best solutions for them as well as for all others, but whoever rebels against these must bear the consequences in their own responsibility. In truth, we cannot do any more than develop the best possible advice, but the observance of the advice lies with the group members themselves. Billy says everyone knows that, however. Quetzal says that is of correctness, but unfortunately, several group members still lack the concept for this. This means that they are very well aware of the fact that they themselves are not yet clear about the truth in this regard. Billy says which is, unfortunately, the case with many earth human beings. Quetzal says that, too, is of correctness. Billy says must we still speak further of these things? Quetzal says no. Billy says good, then I have a question regarding so-called UFOs, which are truly none at all. As I know from you, the so-called flying objects that are considered UFOs are often observed in the day as well as at night. At night, it is often observed that these so-called UFOs light up and are vibrant in their intensity and also variable in color. On the one hand, you were able to make it understandable to me, with tangible evidence and through my personal observations, that these sometimes deal with bio-organic missiles that are truly other dimensioned life forms that, as a rule, can be captured on infrared film and that penetrate from other dimensions into our dimension area, in order to romp around here somehow in earthly airspace for playful and whimsical reasons. You also explained to me that these bioorganisms are completely harmless and that they always return back to their dimension. But on the other hand, you have also spoken of the fact that similar phenomena appeared in terrestrial airspace, but these are purely terrestrial in origin. At that time, you spoke of the fact that it can also concern huge swarms of insects that let themselves drift through the air at great heights. 
During the day, these insect swarms can be seen as dark and form changing and fast that often even glow. At night, the same can be observed, and these UFOs then glow from weak to very strong and often even pulsate. Those are the two forms of UFOs best known to me, which are truly not extraterrestrial ships and which are composed of living forms. Although, you have explained that other such forms exist, about which you have told me some things, but today, I am mainly interested in the apparent UFOs, which consist of insect swarms. I would like to know a few things about this from you, if you have enough time to give me information about it. Quetzal says if you have no further questions. Billy says only two or three personal ones. Quetzal says then listen as a rule, it concerns masses of insect swarms, which must be calculated with millions of individual insects. These insects can be driven in gigantic swarms to high altitudes which are often kilometers high, where they are able to exist in the thin atmosphere with astonishing ease and often let themselves drift through the air currents for hundreds and thousands of kilometers. The size, shape, and movement of these insect swarms appear on radar screens as simulated flying objects, as also observers mistakenly suppose that these are unidentified flying objects. Then, these inaccurate observations, as well as the deceptive pictures of the radar devices, always lead to the fact that such insect swarms are designated as UFOs with astonishing regularity. Especially when such swarms of insects are observed at night, it is seen that these unidentified flying objects appear as illuminated bodies that either shine faintly or very strongly and that often pulsate. As I know, such light is usually described by the observers as a glow. Thousands of these swaying insects, united in one swarm, can muster up a light intensity that can be seen for kilometers. But if the swarms of insects are even larger, if several tens of thousands or even millions unite, then the light creation of this mass is so strong that it can be observed by the naked eye up to 180 kilometers away and more as a strong light source flying at a very high speed, while performing aerial maneuvers that can't be executed by any earthly aircraft. Forward and reverse flights at extremely rapid speeds, as well as zigzag flight maneuvers and right angled as well as left angled flight maneuvers and vertical drops and climbs are the norm, depending on the falling winds and rising winds and other various air currents prevailing at these great heights, which often cause the insect swarms, when these drift into them, to be driven off at right or left angles, etc. or driven back again with a counter current of wind. These are the so-called wild or completely crazy flight maneuvers of these alleged UFOs, as the observers then report. But such observations do actually look deceivingly real, according to which it could and can actually be concluded that these are some extraterrestrial flying objects, if the observations are made by observers who are uneducated in these things or by prejudiced UFO believers. Nevertheless, Many who have more experience in this area can also be deceived by these insects, as you know. The fact that you can no longer be deceived is only because of your experience, which you could get through as and through your own initiative. But now, concerning the origin of the lights and the pulsation of these insect swarms, the following is to be explained like on every planet in the universe, the Earth's atmosphere is permeated by a variety of weaker and stronger electric fields, which also differ in their vibrations. The higher into the atmosphere these penetrate, the richer in occurrence these electric force fields become, which very often move along for many hundreds or thousands of kilometers. Now, if the high-flying insect swarms drift into such electric force fields, which also usually move with the air currents, then the insects start to light up, which appears as a glowing. Because the swarms are, on the one hand, steady in their movement down, on the other hand, the electric energy fields waver in their strength, there arises a swelling or dwindling of the glow or radiance because the weaker the energy field is, the weaker is the radiance. However, the radiance also loses its strength through the constant turning motions of the insects themselves. From this originates the so-called pulsating of these allegedly unidentified flying objects. On the other hand, 
The color changes connected with such alleged objects appear because the strength of the electric energy fields lets the radiance or the glow become more intense or weaker, in which case also the air shifts and the trembling and flickering of the air form color changing factors, so it can be observed, for example, that the white color of light suddenly becomes red, blue, or green or even yellow, weak, or intense. But the fact that this radiance or glow can appear at all is because the insects have substances on their bodies and wings that begin to glow or light up as soon as they come in contact with electric currents, which is, indeed, the case when they drift into electric fields at high altitudes or even near the ground. Furthermore, they are also types of insect swarms that soar through the atmosphere, which have their own luminosity and, thus, generate a light or glow in themselves. Billy says I know, there are species of cicadas on the earth that produce their own lights in their bodies. Also, the little glow worms known in Europe belong to these self-candlesticks, if I may unprofessionally say so. Quetzal says that is of correctness. Billy says the so-called marine lights are also based on the same principle. Through you, I know that the marine lights were often seen by the seafarers as sea monsters and terrifying figures, etc., especially when the sea was moving a little and thereby moved the marine lights more than what is normally the case. But in modern times, it is only rare that this light appearing on the sea is referred to as a monster, etc. because today, the UFO craze prevails which is why the marine lights are always seen nowadays as UFOs that still perform incredible flight maneuvers. But in truth, it is also the case that these marine lights are caused by types of insects. However, these do not fly through the air and also don't live on land, rather, their area of life is the sea water or fresh water, depending on the type. Thus, these are the luminous little worms of the seas or lakes, pools or ponds, etc. But furthermore, from personal experience, I still know of alleged UFOs that are neither insects nor other life forms but rather self-luminous energy fields that form damn similar manifestations as the flying insects, etc. when they are driven through the atmosphere by the air currents. As you once explained to me, these are static energy fields that dissolve in this way of glowing. But then, I still know the manifestations of static energy forms that rush like wheels or balls along the ground or through the air, which suddenly explode like balls of lightning. Last to mention are the gas forms that sometimes form quite bizarre figures or that are simply round and that brightly hover just above the ground. But so far, I could only observe these in the more areas and swamps, etc., which is certainly also logical because they originate from the fact that in the swamps and moors, luminous gases form caused by putrefaction processes and other chemical conversion processes, and these then retreat upwards, rising high over the swamp or over the moor and then appearing as hovering bright lights. With us, we simply call these things crazy lights. But unfortunately, it is also the case that in the present time, observers of such things always want to see UFOs, in contrast to earlier times, when such phenomena haunted through the popular delusion as devils and demons. Quetzal says that is of the most exact correctness. You have very good knowledge in these things. Billy says I also had a good teacher in you. Quetzal says once again, you forget your own experience and your own initiative. Billy says tell me rather something more about the insect swarms why, actually, do they fly through the air in this type and manner? Quetzal says the insects have a very peculiar urge, namely that regardless of their natural desire for food, nesting places, etc., they are simply driven at times, as if by compulsion, to fly high up into the sky. Their entire inner being is still only dominated by this urge, by which they also completely lose any interest in food and in the opposite sex. The reason why the only goal of these insects is to rise high into the air spaces, where they can let themselves be driven by the winds often to very distant goals, is that by natural laws, they are incited to change their habitat in order to preserve their kind. If the insects would stay in their old habitat for a longer time, then it would mean extinction for them. 
Nevertheless, their natural instinct warns them of this, and therefore, if they start to feel that their present habitat is becoming dangerous for them and that simply an overpopulation of their kind is taking place, then there arises in them the peculiar urge to master the beginning goal, which is to let themselves rise high into the air or be driven away by the wind, by the thousands and millions, after which they are then driven as gigantic swarms by the prevailing winds to their new habitat. Billy says in America, these swarms are often observed in enormous numbers, in contrast to Europe. Are there more such kinds of insects that move over the country in large swarms, and what is the main kind? Quetzal says yes, these insects appear there more, namely far to the north into Canada and down to the deepest south into Tierra del Fuego, which, like Canada, no longer belongs to America. The currently best known kind is the so-called spruce bud worm. The technical Latin term for it is Caria stonia refumiferana. The only reason why the spruce bud worm is best known is because presently and in recent years, it can be observed the most often, for there are still many other kinds of these insects that float so high up through the air. Approximately calculated. There are 25,30 species, including dragonflies, spiders, grasshoppers, flies, wasps, bees, ants, termites, beetles, and bugs of all kinds, etc. It is also very interesting to know that very many flightless insects let themselves float high in the atmosphere by the winds, such as spiders, which can be found very often in large clusters and which, like all other insects, also let themselves drift along at altitudes between 2,30 and 5,30 meters. On warm spring days, for example, Hundreds and thousands of small spiders often clump together after hatching, and they would all have to starve miserably if they would be bound to their birthplace, where they would have to become bigger and grow up. But in order to escape this death, they climb up high, sharp blades of grass or tree branches, etc. and lift their hindquarters into the air. Then, when wind arises, these tiny and almost one millimeter long arachnids spin a silk thread that is a thousand times thinner than the thickness of a human hair. This silk thread, however, which is woven into the blowing wind, is taken by the wind and carried high up into the atmosphere, while at the end of the thread hangs the tiny spider, which can be carried so high into the air and also hundreds and thousands of kilometers away to a new home. This, then, is also the reason why at great heights, earthly aircraft are often covered with a coating of the finest transparent silk when they fly through a swarm of the tiniest spiders, which are to be calculated in their number with hundreds of thousands or millions. In this wonderful way of using air to overcome distances, the insects very often reach very distant areas, in order to find a new habitat, which they could otherwise never reach by their own means of going and flying whereby their species will become destroyed and extinct. In the case of a proliferation of insects at a place, the surplus can migrate and set off into other areas that are suitable for them by the winds, which is often observed by the earth human beings, especially at night, after which they then incorrectly suppose or simply believe that they are extraterrestrial missiles and, thus, UFOs. What is still to be said is that even seeds and pollen of floral areas likewise move through the air, often thousands of kilometers away, in order to fertilize their own kind through wind pollination. And all such drifting pollen, which lets itself be carried away high into the air by the winds, can bear the often stark climate changes as easily as also the insects. All these insects and the pollen, however, are absolutely dependent on the prevailing wind currents for their transportation around the globe, by which they are carried into their new homeland. Thus, they cannot determine their flight direction themselves because they do not go against the forces of the winds, which is why they must simply let themselves drift along in these. Billy says it strikes me that you've also mentioned the pollen. Apparently, so I infer from this, it must also appear to human beings as UFOS when it drifts into electrical fields. Quetzal says that is of correctness because the same process also takes place with pollen when the clusters are dense enough. 
But the same also happens with sandstorms and the like when enormous amounts of dust, etc. are torn high into the atmosphere and then transported. All of this can be observed not only at night but also during the day. Billy says that was exhaustive enough more about that would probably only cause confusion. Now, I only have private questions. Quetzal says we will turn to those soon. But first, I must, unfortunately, bring up something again that is unpleasant and that should be announced in general it concerns another detail of my inspection. In this part, I've noticed that several new group members repeatedly bring to light self-ambitions and lust for power. In particular, I must point out here that these group members are domineering and bossy toward the older members or else bring them into confusion with untruthfulness. In particular, I must, in this respect, complain of Margaret Rose who isn't very exact with the truth, while also Ingrid must be addressed in this regard. Also on her side, it isn't right that she draws some conclusions from events and observations, in order then to bring these up reproachfully with those concerned or with those unconcerned. Especially in her case I had to recognize that her knowledge of humans and her assessments usually don't have any true core values, so just for this reason, she should refrain from such machinations. She absolutely must learn to be silent and Margaret should do this as well and on the other hand, it isn't right that she manifests her overbearing nature with the group members or can bring it to application. This is a clear offense against the ordinal rules, which needs to be punished for not complying with my advice, as it has to be done in accordance with the statutes. Various group members already feel attacked and harassed by Ingrid, as it already happens in some cases with the children, who don't dare to defend themselves, However, the rules also state that no group member, without the presence of one accused, has to put this one at a disadvantage by words or actions, which Ingrid should think about. All rules of order as well as the regulations and statutes are also valid for her. She neither has special rights nor any special status, so she has to adapt herself into what is given just like all others, otherwise, the statutory measures must be brought to application. Thus, she forms no exception. Such an exception can also never be the case, not even for others. In the future, this is to be made clear to every new group member by the board of directors. Billy says always these annoying things. Quetzal says unfortunately yes, but now to your private matters. The end. <laughs>